Part three of Acres of Diamonds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Acres of Diamonds by Russell H. Conwell. Part three. But a rich man's son can never know that. He takes his bride into a finer mansion, it may be, but he has obliged to go all the way through it and say to his wife, my mother gave me that, my mother gave me that, and my mother gave me this, until his wife wishes he had married his mother. I pity the rich man's son. The statistics of Massachusetts showed that not one rich man's son out of seventeen ever dies rich. I pity the rich man's sons unless they have the good sense of the elder Vanderbilt, which sometimes happens. He went to his father and said, did you earn all your money? I did, my son. I began to work on a ferry boat for twenty-five cents a day. Then, said his son, I will have none of your money. And he, too, tried to get employment on a ferry boat that Saturday night. He could not get one there, but he did get a place for three dollars a week. Of course, if a rich man's son will do that, he will get the discipline of a poor boy that is worth more than the university education of any man. He would then be able to take care of the millions of his father. But as a rule, the rich men will not let their sons do the very thing that made them great. As a rule, the rich man will not allow his son to work. And his mother, why, she would think it was a social disgrace if a poor, weak, little, lily-fingered, sissy sort of a boy had to earn his living with honest toil. I have no pity for such rich men's sons. I remember one at Niagara Falls. I think I remember one a great deal nearer. I think there are gentlemen present who were at a great banquet, and I beg pardon of his friends. At a banquet here in Philadelphia, there sat beside me a kind-hearted young man, and he said, Mr. Conwell, you have been sick for two or three years. When you go out, take my limousine, and it will take you up to your house on Broad Street. I thanked him very much, and perhaps I ought not mention the incident in this way, but I follow the facts. I got on the seat with the driver of the limousine outside, and when we were going up, I asked the driver, How much did this limousine cost? Six thousand eight hundred, and he had to pay the duty on it. Well, I said, does the owner of this machine ever drive it himself? At that, the chauffeur laughed so heartily that he lost control of his machine. He was so surprised at the question that he ran up on the sidewalk and around the corner lamp post out onto the street again. And when he got out onto the street, he laughed till the whole machine trembled. He said, he drive this machine? Oh, he would be lucky if he knew enough to get out when we get there. I must tell you about a rich man's son at Niagara Falls. I came in from the lecture to the hotel, and as I approached the desk, there stood a millionaire's son from New York. He was an indiscernible specimen of anthropologic potency. He had a skull cap on one side of his head with a gold tassel in the top of it, and a gold headed cane under his arm, with more in it than in his head. It was a very difficult thing to describe that man. He wore an eyeglass that he could not see through, patent leather boots that he could not walk in, and pants that he could not sit down in, dressed like a grasshopper. This human cricket came up to the clerk's desk just as I entered, adjust his unseeing eyeglass, and spake, in this wise to the clerk. You see, he thought it was Hinglish, you know, to lisp. There, will I have your kindness to supply me thumb paper and thumb envelope? The clerk measured that man quick and pulled out the envelopes and paper out of a drawer, threw them across the counter toward the young man, and then turned away to his book. You should have seen that young man when those envelopes came across the counter. He swelled like a gobbler turkey, adjusted his unseeing eyeglass, and yelled, Come right back here now there. Will you order a servant to take that paper and envelopes to your desk? 
Oh, the poor, miserable, contemptible American monkey. He could not carry paper and envelopes twenty feet. I suppose he could not get his arms down to it. I have no pity for such travesties upon human nature. If you have not capital, young man, I am glad of it. What you need is common sense, not copper sense. The best thing I can do is to illustrate by actual facts well known to all of you. A.T. Stewart, a poor boy in New York, had $1.50 to begin life on. He lost 87 and a half cents of that on his very first venture. How fortunate that young man who loses the first time he gambles. That boy said, I will never gamble again in business, and he never did. How can you lose 87 and a half cents? You probably all know the story, how he lost it, because he bought some needles, threads, and buttons to sell, which people did not want, and had left him on his hands, a dead loss. Said the boy, I will not lose any more money in that way. Then he went around first to the doors and asked the people what they did want. Then, when he had found what they wanted, he invested his sixty-two and a half cents to supply a known demand. Study it wherever you choose, in business, in your profession, in your housekeeping, whatever your life, that one thing is the secret of success. You must first know the demand, you must first know what people need, and then invest yourself where it is most needed. A.T. Stewart went on that principle until he was worth what amounted afterward to forty millions of dollars, owning the very store in which Mr. Wanamaker carries on his great work in New York. This fortune was made by his losing something, which taught him the great lesson that he must only invest himself or his money in something that people need. When will you salesmen learn that? When will you manufacturers learn that you must know the changing needs of humanity if you would succeed in life? Apply yourselves, all you Christian people, as manufacturers or merchants or workmen to supply that human need. That is a great principle, as broad as humanity and as deep as the scripture itself. The best illustration I have ever heard was of John Jacob Astor. You know that he made his money of the Astor family and when he lived in New York, he came across the sea in debt for his fare. But that poor boy, with nothing in his pocket, made the fortune of the Astor family on one principle. Some young men here tonight will say, well, they could make that fortune in New York, but they could not do it in Philadelphia. My friends, did you ever read that wonderful book of Rias? His memory is sweet to us because of his recent death wherein is given his statistical account of the records taken in 1889 of 107 millionaires of New York. If you read the account, you will see that out of 107 millionaires, only seven made their money in New York. Out of the 107 millionaires worth $10 million in real estate, then 67 of them made their money in towns of less than 3,500 inhabitants. The richest men in this country today, if you read the real estate values, has never moved away from the town of 3,500 inhabitants. It makes not so much difference where you are as who you are. But if you cannot get rich in Philadelphia, you certainly cannot do it in New York. Now John Jacob Astor illustrated what can be done anywhere. He had a mortgage once on a millinery store, and they could not sell bonnets enough to pay the interest on his money. So he foreclosed that mortgage, took possession of the store, and went into partnership with the very same people in the same store with the same capital. He did not give them a dollar of capital. They had to sell goods to get any money. Then he left them alone in the store just as they had been before and he went out and sat down on a bench in a park in the shade. What was John Jacob Astor doing out there and in partnership with people who had failed on their own hands? He had the most important and in my mind the most pleasant part of that partnership on his hands. For as John Jacob Astor sat on that bench, he was watching the ladies as they went by 
and where is the man who would not get rich in that business as he sat on the bench if a lady passed him with her shoulders back and head up and looked straight to the front as if she did not care if all the world did not gaze on her then he studied her bonnet and by the time she was out of sight he knew the shape of the frame the color of the trimmings the cracklings of the feather i sometimes try to describe a bonnet but not always i would not try and describe a modern bonnet where is the man that can describe one this aggression of all sorts of driftwood stuck in the back of the head on the side of the neck like a rooster with only one tail and feather left but in john jacob astor's day there was some art about the millinery business and he went to the millinery store and said to them now put into the show window just such a bonnet as i described to you because i have already seen a lady who likes such a bonnet don't make up any more until i come back then he went out and sat down again and another lady passed him of a different form of different complexion with a different shape and color of bonnet now said he put such a bonnet as that in the show window he did not fill the show window uptown with lots of hats and bonnets to drive people away and then sit on the back stairs and bawl because people went to wanamakers to trade he did not have a hat or bonnet in that show window but what some lady liked before it was made up the tide of custom began immediately to turn in and it had been a foundation of the greatest store in new york in that line there still exists as one of three stores its fortune was made by john jacob astor after they failed in business not by giving them any more money but by finding out what ladies liked for bonnets before they wasted any material in making them up i tell you if a man could foresee the millinery business he could foresee anything under heaven i suppose i were to go up through the audience tonight and ask you in this great manufacturing city if there were any opportunities to get rich in manufacturing oh yes some young men says there are opportunities here still if you build with some trust and if you have two or three millions of dollars to begin with as capital young men the history of the breaking up of trusts by that attack upon big business is only illustrating what is now the opportunity of the smaller man the time never came in the history of the world when you could not get rich by quickly manufacturing without capital as you can now but you will say you cannot do anything of the kind you cannot start without capital young men let me illustrate for a moment i must do it it is my duty to every young man and woman because we are all going into business very soon on the same plan young man remember if you know what people need and you have gotten more knowledge of the fortune than any amount of capital can give you there was a young man out of work living in hingham massachusetts he lounged around the house until one day his wife told him to get out and work and as he lived in massachusetts he obeyed his wife he went out and sat down on the shore of the bay and whittled a soaked shingle out into a wooden chain his children that evening quarreled over it and he whittled a second one to keep peace while he was whittling the second one a neighbor came in and said why don't you whittle toys and sell them you could make money at that oh he said i would not know what to make why don't you ask your own children right here in your own house what to make what is the use of trying that said the carpenter my children are different from other people's children i used to see people like that when i taught school but he acted upon the hint and the next morning when mary came down the stairway he asked what do you want for a toy she began to tell him she would like a doll's bed a doll's washstead a doll's carriage a little doll's umbrella and went on with a list of things that it would take a lifetime to supply so consulting his own children in his own house he took the firewood for he had no money to buy lumber and whittled those strong unpainted hingham toys that were for so many years known all over the world that man began to make those toys for his own children and then made copies and sold them through the boot and shoe store next door he began to make a little money and then a little more 
and Mr. Lawson and his frenzied finance says that a man can be the richest man in old Massachusetts, and I think it is the truth, and that man is worth hundred millions of dollars today. He has been only thirty-four years making it on that one principle, that one must judge what his own children like at other people's children would like in their homes too. To judge the human heart by one's self, by one's wife or one's children, it is the royal road to success in manufacturing. Oh, but you say, he didn't have any capital? Yes, a penknife, but I don't know what he had paid for it. I spoke thus to an audience in New Britain, Connecticut, and the lady four seat back went home and tried to take off her collar, and the collar button stuck in the buttonhole. She threw it out and said, I'm going to get up something better than that to put on collars. Her husband said, but after what Conwell said tonight, you see there is a need for an improved collar fastener that is easier to handle. There is a human need. There is a great fortune. Now then, get up a collar button and get rich. He made fun of her, and consequently made fun of me, and that is one of the saddest things which ever comes over me like a deep cloud of midnight sometimes. Although I have worked so hard for more than half a century, yet how little I have ever really done. Notwithstanding the greatness and the handsomeness of your compliment tonight, I do not believe there is one in ten of you that is going to make a million dollars because you are here tonight. But that is not my fault. It is yours. I say that sincerely. What is the use of my talking if people never do it when I advise them to do? When her husband ridiculed her, she made up her mind that she would make a better collar button. And when a woman makes up her mind, she will. And does not say anything about it. She does it. It was that New England woman who invented the snap button, which you can find anywhere now. It was first a collar button with a spring cap attached to the outer side. Any of you who wear modern waterproofs know that button simply pushes together, and when you unbutton it, you simply pull it apart. That is the button to which I refer, and which she invented. She afterward invented several other buttons, and then invested in more. And then she was taken into partnership with great factories. Now that woman goes over the sea every summer in her private steamship. Yes, and takes her husband with her. If her husband were to die, she would have enough money left now to buy a foreign duke, or count, or some other such title that is at the latest quotations. Now what sort of lesson in that incident? It is this. I told her then, though I did not know her, what I now say to you. Your wealth is so near you, you are looking right over it. And she had to look over it because it was right under her chin. I have read in the newspaper that a woman never invented anything. Well, that newspaper ought to begin again. Of course, I do not refer to gossip. I refer to machines. And if I might better include the men, that newspaper could never appear if a woman had not invented something. Friends think, ye women think, you cannot make a fortune because you are in some laundry or running a sewing machine. It may be, or walking before some loom. And yet you can be a millionaire if you just follow this almost infallible direction. When you say a woman doesn't invent anything, I ask, who invented the jacquard loom that wove every stitch you wear? Mrs. Jacquard. The printer's roller, the printing press, were invented by farmers' wives. Who invented the cotton gin of the South that enriched our country so amazingly? Mrs. General Green invented the cotton gin and showed the idea to Mr. Whitney, and he, like a man, seized it. Who was it that invented the sewing machine? If I would go to school tomorrow and ask your children, they would say, Elias Howe. He was in the Civil War with me, and often in my tent I often heard him say that he worked fourteen years to get up that sewing machine, but his wife made up her mind that one day they would starve to death if there wasn't something or other invented pretty soon. So in two hours she invented the sewing machine. Of course, 
he took out the patent in his name men always do that who was it who invented the mower and the reaper according to mr mccormick's confidential communication so recently published it was a west virginia woman who after his father and he had failed altogether in making a reaper and gave it up took a lot of shears and nailed them together on the edge of a board with one shaft of each pair loose and then wired them so when she pulled the wire one way it closed down and when she pulled the wire the other way it opened then and there she had the principle of the mowing machine if you look at the mowing machine you will see that it is nothing but a lot of shears if a woman can invent a mowing machine if a woman can invent a jacquard loom if a woman can invent a cotton gin if a woman can invent a trolley switch as she did and made the trolleys possible if a woman can invent as mr carnegie said the great iron squeezers that laid the foundation of all the steel millions in the united states we men can invent anything under the stars i say that for the encouragement of the men who are the great inventors of the world again this lesson comes before us the great inventor sits next to you or you are the person yourself oh but you will say i have never invented anything in my life neither did the great inventors until they discovered one great secret do you think it is a man with a head like a bushel measure or a man like a stroke of lightning it is neither a really great man is a plain straightforward everyday common sense man you would not dream that he was a great inventor if you did not see something that he had actually done his neighbors do not regard him as so great you never see anything great over your back fence you say there is no greatness among your neighbors it is all away off somewhere else their greatness is so ever simple so plain so earnest so practical that the neighbors and friends would never recognize it end of part three